Bienvenidos a esta nueva edición de Trading Risk and Beyond. Soy Gerardo Herrera, su anfitrión. En esta ocasión, el tema que abordaremos será ¿Modelos de riesgo son todavía válidos? A partir de la crisis de 2008, originada en el sector financiero y donde muchos de estos modelos probaron ser ineficaces, ha habido una gran discusión. Karl Popper, el filósofo de la ciencia, decía que todo modelo teórico es simplemente una aproximación a la realidad y lo que nos mostró la crisis de 2008 es que efectivamente la realidad estuvo más allá de la capacidad de los modelos de interpretarla. Para discutir este interesante tema, tenemos el día de hoy a tres notorios expertos al respecto. En primer lugar, John Hall. En segundo lugar, Emmanuel Derma. Y finalmente, Paul Wilmot. Trading Risk and Beyond ha reunido a esta galería de expertos para discutir los modelos de riesgo, cuál es su futuro, todavía nos funcionan, qué hay que hacer al respecto para garantizar que una crisis como la de 2008 no vuelva a pasar. Acompáñeme en esta relevante y profunda discusión sobre uno de los temas de mayor actualidad en las finanzas y administración del riesgo el día de hoy. Some people have blamed models for the crisis, and uh, in fact, there, be, there have even been blogs out there which have said that uh, David Lee, who developed the, the Gaussian Cochlea model, which was used to value these tranches of ABSs and ABS CDOs, you know, that was a bad model, and that's what caused everybody to do bad things. I mean, I think that's totally ridiculous. I, it's It's not models that cause the problem, it's people and how they use the models that causes the problem. All the models that we have in for pricing derivatives are very approximate representations of reality. We're honest about it, really. Um, re really but, but what they do is they provide traders and other people with a framework for thinking about the market. And implying parameters from the market, detecting trends in the market, and that sort of thing. And uh, so long as models are used sensibly, there's no problem. But as soon as people start believing the models to be perfect representations of reality, that's where we have problems, because the models are just really a way to enable traders to think about, think about the world a little bit more definitely than they would have been able to otherwise. But we should, you know, take, take a very simple model like Black Scholes. I mean, <laughs> there's been no end of improvements to Black Scholes in the sense of making Black Scholes more um, closer to the sort, of, the, the sort of way traders actually price options. And, you know, maybe there's, uh, you know, there's a volatility smile, a volatility skew, and all that sort of thing. But traders still use Black Scholes because Black Scholes is a nice, simple way of thinking about the world and thinking about the volatility environment that they're facing out there in the world. Um, but you'll be in trouble if you actually believed Black Scholes was the truth. Guns don't kill people, people kill people. So it, it doesn't go down that well. But I think um, Paul and I actually once wrote an article about a, a, an op-ed in, the, in, the, in Newsweek in 2009 around the crisis when people were blaming models. And I think there was a knee-jerk reaction on the part of the public. and. Um, Um, uh, yeah, a, a bunch of famous people, including Paul Volcker. He, Paul Volcker wrote a wrote an open letter to his grandson, who was a quant, sort of accusing him of uh, of using bad models and quoting how his grandson had said to him, um, "It's not my fault. I only did what what people were telling me to do." And Paul Volcker said to him, "I won't accept the Nuremberg excuse," um, which I thought was a bit extreme. Um, But I think what John said is basically right. Um, you know, nevertheless, I, I think it's a little too easy. People, people build models, and then the people who use them higher up, or who use the quants and make use of them higher up, do tend to take the models more literally than they should. And it, it's kind of hard to know what to do about that. Um, I'm hopping around a little bit. Nevertheless, I don't think the crisis was the fault of models. Um, if you look at The copy of the models were maybe, you could argue they were to blame in this country, but Iceland had a terrible crisis. 
and that had nothing to do with anything to do with bonds. It simply had to do with too much leverage. Um, Spain had a mortgage market that, um, that imploded and had nothing to do with CMO models. There were no securitized mortgages over there. And I think the bigger underlying issue is, um, from my point of view, although I wouldn't defend quants, but I think the bigger underlying issue is, um, is the Fed keeping interest rates low, encouraging leverage, encouraging people to go out on a limb and borrow as much money as possible all over the world. Whenever there's been a crisis, um, the standard reaction is to lower interest rates. It's sort of hair of the dog that bit you. If, you. if you borrow too much money, make it even easier for you to borrow money so that um, you can repay your loans. And I think that's been a bigger problem in the financial crisis than models. I think everybody does believe the models, and I think people are encouraged to believe the models. I, I have taken the position in things I've written, I've said right at the start of books, for example, don't believe anything, you know, take it all with a pinch of salt, don't believe any, any of these models, and don't believe anything you read in this book, i.e. my book. But people are not encouraged like that. You take someone like um, Alan Greenspan and uh, the economics models, when the, the, the crisis hit, I forget his exact quote, but he he expressed some kind of psychological turmoil that these things he believed in all his life suddenly turned out not to be the case. And he's supposed to be an intelligent person. So I can't believe, but it is true, I can't believe, I'm surprised at how much people do believe in these models. Well, the models are the enabler for people to do bad things. Now, you hear stories about a trader will go to some risk manager and say, can you tell me the, um, the, the amount of risk in, in my position? So the quant goes and says, this is, the, the, this is the amount of risk. And the trader goes, no, it's not. If you catch my drift, go back and redo your calculations, which means go back, change your parameters or whatever to give a smaller number so that he can trade more. So it's very easy to, to abuse these models. Yeah. Well, I think, I think we want to distinguish between models that are used for pricing and models that are used for risk management. And uh, I, I guess my comments were mostly about using models for pricing. And uh, Emmanuel's actually written you know, some really good material on the difference between how we use models in finance and how physicists use models. In physics, a model is an absolute truth. In finance, we change the volatility every day. And so it's, there's, 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 it's, that, not, that it's not an absolute truth. And, and that's, where, that's where I come back to, you know, the model is a way of thinking about the world. Now, when you come on to risk management, yeah, there's the, and, and, and value at risk and, and uh, ways of uh, manipulating value at risk. Yeah, we all know you can do that. And uh, the regulators are getting right on top of this with stressed bar and that sort of thing these days. Uh, from, a, from a scientific perspective, I, I, that, that causes me problems because really pricing and risk management ought, ought to all be sort of at the same level, really. They should be internally consistent. That, that, maybe that's t totally impossible, but that would be the, idea cause it, the ideal, because at the moment it feels more like alchemy than science, where something works sometimes, sometimes it doesn't, so you do something else, and it, it doesn't quite gel. Regulators are idiots. Yeah. And, and by, the, and by the way, while, while we're about it, let me dissociate myself from your comment that regulators are idiots. Because I, 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 I am. Um, just you know, in case I, somebody's just listening. Just in case somebody's listening. Yeah, I, I've, um, you know, I, I'm pretty impressed with. I mean, regulators have got an incredibly difficult job. I mean, you have you ever tried to work out what a large bank like, you know, J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs is actually doing? It's 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 it's, it's incredibly difficult as a, as a as a bank supervisor mm -hmm. to, to 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 get on top of things. I think you know, given all the constraints they're working under. Um, they do pretty well, and I'm pretty impressed with most of the regulators. As far as having a consistent framework, actually, this is one of the areas I'm working in right now, uh, you know, between risk management and uh, valuation. But the thing about valuation, of course, is that we use this risk-neutral valuation paradigm. But as far as risk management is concerned, we want to work in the real-world measure. It's the Q measure versus the P measure. I, I gave it, and I think one of the big your sort of important areas for research going forward, given that we've had the crisis and everybody's much more focused on risk management, is to develop really good ways of going from the Q measure, the risk neutral measure, to the P measure. But, but when, I, when I talk about all the different models, I have a, a kind of standard line that I use all the time and it works without, without fail. I will talk about different models and I can always say that if a model is good, it won't be popular. 
if a model is bad, it will be popular. It's a, it's a kind of universal law of, of quant finance. I, I think the right way to look at all of this um, is, is, this is my argument, I wrote this down somewhere once said, there's only one, although in the natural sciences there are a lot of laws that work, mm -hmm. um, in finance there's only one law, and that's if you want to know what something is worth, um, try to find a portfolio. If you want to know what something illiquid is worth, try to find a portfolio of liquid securities that have the same future payoffs under all scenarios. And then the value of that portfolio in the market is the value of what your illiquid thing is worth. And so then you've got, so I think all of finance consists of this. How to value something illiquid is to find a set of illiquid things that replicate it. And then if you want to say it replicates it under all scenarios, the scientific part is you're obliged to say, what do you mean by all scenarios? Do you mean geometric Brownian, um, log, log normal geometric Brownian motion? Or do you mean geometric Brownian motion with jumps? Or do you mean jumps plus jumps in volatility? That's your job and that's the science. Then the engineering part, which is what we do more of, is, um, is trying to construct a portfolio that behaves the same as the target portfolio and all those scenarios. And, and the engineering works fairly well, actually. The part that really fails is the scientific part in that you simply cannot write down a set of scenarios that replicate all the things that are going to happen in the world under which you want to replicate something. And in physics or in chemistry, you can do a pretty good job of writing down a stochastic differential equation that describes the way dust in the room is going to move. You cannot do that with stock prices. And so there's, there's a hole in the science. But I think in a way that sort of, it doesn't matter whether you're a quant or you're fundamental, what you're ultimately doing is trying to say, can I find a bunch of things whose prices I know that will behave in the future, the same as this thing whose price I don't know. This dichotomy between quants and fundamental traders is artificial or is it real? I mean, is, what is the right balance between the two approaches? Well, the balance is something there, there is, the truth is out there or in the, in the middle <laughs> somehow. Okay. It's, it's a combination of things, really. And that, that, that's, uh, yeah, my, my earlier comment about the, the scientific thing, I, I realized I sort of painted myself into a corner that, 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 <laughs> that you never will get the, the fundamental laws um, of anything. So maybe the alchemic approach is actually the, the best one, or an, an engineer, it's called an engineering approach, is the, is the sensible one. Uh, ultimately, I don't, I don't know, does any of this really matter? I, I mean, sorry, I'm a bit jaded. Um, <laughs> does any of it really matter? The, the, as long as you work for a bank, you're going to be really, really rich. It doesn't matter what mo models you use. <laughs> well, bankers just take a cut of everything we do. So as long as they just keep their noses clean. There's the Warren Buffett approach to asset management, mm -hmm. which is the fundamental, um, fundamental approach. And then there's the quant approach to asset management using, say, black letterman models and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, I agree with you actually that, you know, within, within some of the more, um, some of the more forward looking pension funds and other asset management co companies, there is, there, there is this tension. Exactly. I mean, CPPIB, which is a large, it's a large pension course. fund in, in, yeah, in Toronto and um, it uh, manages a huge amount of money, in fact, it manages the the state pension of every man, woman, and child in Canada. Um, they, they had a very much a quant philosophy until the guy at the top changed. <laughs> and now, now they've moved to a fundamental philosophy. But it's very easy for, for ordinary mortals to understand fundamental stuff. You know, mm -hmm. We invest in this company because it's got this product. And, yeah, that's a cool product. But if you're doing quant stuff, it's very, very easy for, for people not to understand what they're talking about. And the, the, the P versus Q thing, I, I bet you the number of proper quants who understand that you know, deeply is actually frighteningly small. As these people, you know, to, well, to it try... Is, it is interesting, yeah. I, I think you're absolutely right. The, even, even amongst quants, there's quite a bit of confusion. Mm. And yeah. Actually, I think the regu to get back to your point about re regulators that I talk to understand it really well. Um, and if you read, if you read, for example, the Basel II, Basel III regulations carefully, you'll find references to P measures and Q measures, but um, which which are correct references. But you know, you 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 explain P measure versus Q measure to to somebody, and you know maybe they get it. You know, okay, P measure is for scenario analysis, mm -hmm. Q measure is for valuation, and then you say, but of course, when you do a scenario analysis, you know, you've got a time horizon, say one year. So you do the P measure for all the market variables out to one year. And then you've got to value things. So you've got to use the Q measure 
to value things. And, and, and by that time, you say, oh, no, you can't yeah. be right there. I, I somehow think the solution to all of this is not to use more and more sophisticated models, which in the end are going to be yeah, wrong. Yeah. Yeah. But I like Anat Admati and Martin Helwig in these books that just say, don't let people borrow so much money, you have lower leverage ratios and everything will take care of itself. Well, I think in 2007, 2008, people were blaming quants, but uh, I, yeah, when I grew up, being quant was like a bad thing to do, and now I think it does have a sexy tone. And yeah. if, you look, if you look at people who call themselves quants now, they're not people like John or myself or Paul, they're guys who just do slightly quantitative statistical trading, yeah. you know, they call themselves quant funds where there's nothing old-fashioned quant about them. Well, after all, banks, prime, book, prime brokers, hedge funds hired quants. They must have been doing something right. So uh, what is it that they did right? The well, no, it's marketing. It's good for marketing. Really? Everything, the whole world, everything, the most important thing in the world is marketing and sales. Forget anything else. That's what makes the world go round. And quants are great for marketing. Trying to sell your hedge fund, and you got some quant stuff. Well, risk management too. I mean, I, I was sort mm. of joking, but I think I, I mean there are skills to risk management. But I was I was actually inter interacting with Nassim the other day, and he was saying something about risk management as a profession, and I was half joking, but saying risk management is more of a title than a profession. No cabe duda después de todo lo que hemos oído que los modelos podrán ser muy buenos, podrán tener muchas matemáticas, podrán tener altas finanzas, pero no exentan de que un factor humano los use en forma adecuada no exentan del juicio de aquellos que utilizan los modelos y definitivamente no exentan de un adecuado gobierno corporativo y estrategia de administración de riesgos. Gracias por acompañarnos en esta discusión. Los esperamos en los siguientes programas de Trading Risk and Beyond. Soy Gerardo Herrera, su anfitrión. Gracias.